Hello, my name is Jan van der Vraanen. I work with the War Heritage Institute in Brussels. We have several sites, under which is the Camel Command Bunker. It's a Cold War bunker, uh, which is completely accessible to the public, which is also a museum about the Cold War. And we will discover it now. This bunker was built in 1952 um, as a result of the tensions between East and West. Um, we are now on the historical site. If you enter the site, there is only a small building visible to the public uh, because the bunker, of course, is underneath, underneath us. But in the bunker itself, you will see some plans of the bunker, in which you can see a complete layout, which is quite uh, interesting. It was a secret bunker. Nearly nobody knew that it, it existed. It was only in the 90s um, that the last exercise was held by the Belgian army. And from 2007 onwards, it was uh, given to the Royal Military Museum, who made a new museum here. If you have any questions, just give a shout. So this is the original small building. The only thing which was visible from the street side. And the bunker itself is on that side. But we will see some aerial photographs and some plants as we go into the bunker itself. So now we are descending into the bunker itself. And this first part we explain to the history of the bunker. Which is actually quite interesting uh, because we have some aerial photographs and some building plans here. As you can see here, this photograph was taken in 1954 um, by the Belgian Air Force. This is the building we just came into. And we're now here, somewhere here, um, on site. So if you look at the plan, this is the building. We are now here in a sort of in-between structure between the actual bunker and the guardhouse on top of it. And we will descend further down into this uh, Cold War communications bunker. Um, the bunker itself is protected with a large concrete plate, which protects the bunker against conventional bombardments. Um, which is also quite important. In during was, the Cold it built, War. was it built with uh, protection against nuclear attack? No. In the 1950s, the bunker was not protected against NBC attacks. In the 1960s, they started thinking about it. They made plans, but they never um, worked out because it was very, very, very expensive and it didn't uh, make any sense to, uh, to um, the word. <laughs> um, so the bunker is not NBC protected, not even in the 50s, not even in the 60s, although they studied it, but their work was never carried out because it was way too expensive. Okay. Um, so let's go further down. We have, some, we have had some infiltrations of water into the, in the bunker, as you can see there, but we are working with the uh, Belgian defense to fix everything uh, to get it back uh, into a nice state, of course. Old buildings always require a lot of maintenance, such as old vehicles as well. The bunker was used by the Belgian military as a command bunker. Um, in case of an emergency, a war, or a conflict, but in, in reality, it was only used during uh, exercises. Um, these boxes, as you can see here, these green transport, transport boxes, were used to put in documents uh, from the actual headquarters to be transported to here because everything was top secret. Um, once an exercise started, they could get their documents needed to uh, fulfill their purpose. To, to get the exercise running. And the exercises were always in the NATO context, which is very important to know that the, yeah, the bunker was only used uh, during NATO exercises, such as uh, Wintex, winter exercise, or a Thalex uh, exercise in the fall, uh, by all the NATO countries. Uh, 
the bunker is um, very well equipped for, it, for its time. It has uh, diesel engines, it has a special water well, it has all the uh, facilities to get the bunker running, even in case uh, of bombardments or in case the bunker is closed off of, uh, of the, usual, um, the usual energy facilities, etc., etc. It could work on its own for a couple of days without any problems. But the most important thing on the bunker is the, um, the air supply, of course. It still functions. If that would fall down, the bunker would be very humid. It would start um, yeah, crumbling down. So it's very important that this keeps on functioning since the, the, air, vent, the air vents are really, really important. So we have to keep it uh, running always. The bunker has no large-scale medical facilities, so only a small doctor's cabinet uh, in case of a, a paper cut, for example, or somebody gets gotten well, could be uh, taken care of by a doctor, by the medical staff in the bunker itself. But there were no combat activities here, so it would be quite pointless to have a large-scale medical facilities. Itself is built up between uh, around one large hall, it's the operations room, and there are all offices on each side of the hallways. And we will see this in detail when we enter one of the uh, one of the offices. We have also taken care of the visitor by explaining some of the Cold War context. This is a timeline and some videos about the Cold War um, with some photographs which are. Um, significant for this Cold War period. For example, we have here is the Belgian Prime Minister Paul Henri Spaak, who signs a NATO treatment for Belgium. We have Belgian volunteers going to the Korean War in 1950. Um, we have uh, the Cuban Revolution. We have uh, the construction of the Berlin Wall. This photograph and this one. We have the so-called red telephone between um, the White House and the Kremlin after the Cuba crisis. We have, the, of course, the Vietnam War. We have um, the war in Afghanistan. We have President Reagan's um, Star Wars program. We have the Olympics in Los Angeles, which were boycotted by the, the East. We have the American missiles in Florenian Belgium. We have the Soviet retreat from Afghanistan, we have the German reunification, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and of course the end of the Warsaw Pact, and yeah, the, um, the end of the, the implosion of the Soviet Union in the 1991, all results of the Cold War. So this is explained a bit in this timeline. This is one of the offices I was talking about. Um, they are redecorated as it was somewhere in the 70s, as if the staff is just going out for a smoke or a drink. Um, all material is still available on site. All the offices, chairs, the desks, uh, typewriters, uh, lamps, everything was still available here on site. We just did the finishing touches for, uh, for our audience. And in the end, you can see already uh, a small view of the large operations room, but we will go into detail uh, when he descend deeper into the belly of the bunker. A second room we have redecorated as a museum deals about the Warsaw Pact and NATO because both forces, both large blocks were uh, opposed to each other. Um, as you can see in the photographs, we have the same photographs for the NATO as for Warsaw Pact. We have the, um, the origins of NATO. On the other side, we have the origins of the Warsaw Pact. We have a, a B-52 nuclear bomb um, bomber. And there we have the Tupolev bomber. We have uh, tanks. All Everything is quite the same as in photographs. Um, more importantly here is this map, because in Belgium, in Europe, we always see the Cold War as a conflict in Europe with Germany as a central focus point. But if you turn around the map, more global side, 
you really see why the nuclear uh, capacity was so important. Airplanes, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and sea-launched ballistic missiles. And they were all located more to the north, uh, as you can see, because this area was the most important for this uh, nuclear capacity. But of course, in Europe, uh, stalemate was quite visible as well with the building of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And the display cases illustrate this as well. We have the US soldier opposite of the Russia, the Soviet soldier. We have the uh, soldier of the G uh, West German Bundeswehr opposite of his brother of the uh, East German um, Army, the NVA. And we have the Belgian soldier in NATO context. And we have a Soviet tank driver um, because the biggest fear of the West were the large um, capacities of Soviet tanks, of course. The bunker might feel like a maze, but it's actually quite easy to navigate in. It's all around the central operation room. This is one of the offices used by the, um, the intelligence and the operations. Uh, that's why there were some curtains there. So if in case of more secret meetings, or with classified information, curtains could be closed um, so as nobody could see certain maps or uh, anything uh, classified. All telephones have this um, so-called sticker, which says this phone is not secure because not all lines were secure. Not all information was meant to be transferred by telephone, um, which is really in, uh, important to know in a command bunker, of course. And here we have a first better view on the operation room. Now it's quite dark because we're working on the electricity. Um, in a few days, it will be more bright. It has been a problem for a few years, but now fixing it. Who is the red chair for? The red chair is for the chief of staff. His office is here as well, which has more red chairs. We can take place in it if you want. Um, So if you want to make a phone call home, you can always, uh, always try to use a phone. This old classic. <laughs> this is the emergency exit, which comes out in the flank of the Camel, Camelberg. Um, it has a really, really nice echo, as you can see. In case of an emergency, people have to evacuate through this, uh, this, um, this tunnel. Now, it, was, it has always been the emergency exit. Um, it's only a wooden door with a, a metal bar. So security, even in the, during the Cold War, wasn't the best uh, of security, I think. During exercises, there was always military police in the building and around the building. So there was always... Um, a certain level of control, uh, of course. Um, this is the office of the, let me see, the medical services. And the other office is of the staff of the air forces. So let's continue our visit. We have some cool office nearby. That's yours. <laughs> of course, there's no windows, which is a pity. And this is the office of the uh, chief of the joint staff, uh, yeah, the Belgian general in command of the, the Belgian army. This would be his office. So. You can take a seat if you like in this uh, personal chairs. So it's, a, it's a, the best office in this bunker, of course, because it's cozy seats. And they really are cozy. Um, we shall go down to this um, special staircase. This is a quick link between the second floor and the first floor. 
uh, because all communication centers are downstairs. And if a message came through which was urgent, could immediately be given to the commander of the Belgian troops here. Um, well, immediately, it's only five or four meters difference with the ordinary stairs. But, uh, We are now in the office of the yeah, special dispatch service, the post office of the bunker, as, as it were. Um, they are all, this floor has all of these secrets, a lot of so secret, it has all of these, um, there are these little doors to give messages to, because all communication has to be through these doors, and not through the, the hallway, because most of the messages were classified, not everybody was entitled to see them, of course. Uh, but we will see all this. Communication equipment in the other rooms. Before a message could be sent from the bunker, it had to be encrypted. So this is the, um, the office where all encryption. Uh, was, uh, was done with these special encryption machines. And when this was done, the messages were given through one of these little doors to the other room uh, to be sent uh, to different machinery. This is the central room of the uh, central dispatch, uh, special dispatch room uh, where all information was gathered and then dispatched through different uh, little doors. The bunker has uh, several communication equipment. We have radios, we have uh, TLX writers, we have a uh, telephone system, um, and of course the ordinary uh, postman, the runners, as it were, uh, to get all the messages through. If somebody has, has a message to be dispatched and they could not enter the rooms, they had to give everything to these little doors again because of the classified nature of all the documents. This is the Telex room um, where all messages would be sent. Um, it has sort of sonorization here because the noise would be quite deafening if you have to work here 24 hours a day. Um, with a lot of Telex printers working, it wouldn't be very healthy for you. you so they made some special sonorization in the 1960s. This is the telephone room, uh, which now would you have on your mobile phone, of course. Um, but all lines were connected with this system. So this part of the bunker would be a very, very noisy part, of course. As you can see, here, these are all the different types of radios that could be used by the Belgian army. Uh, to communicate with troops on the front or with other NATO countries, of course. It's a small selection. In real life, it would be more um, would be more radios available, of course. Now we're entering the uh, operations room, which is of course the biggest room in the, in the bunker. Um, this is where the magic happens. Um, all information gathered through this um, dispatch center or all information which was made available by all the different offices had to be available here to the, um, yeah, to the, the Belgian army command, of course. Um, on the right, for example, you have all the different Belgian Air Force wings with different uh, planes available. If a plane was damaged or shot down or had no, didn't have enough fuel, everything was put on this, uh, this uh, uh, information board. They're actually called toad boards. I have a totalizer which can totalize all the information available. We have the Belgian Navy um, with the different ships 
available. And there we have the army with the different uh, vehicles, tanks, uh, self-propelling artillery, etc., etc., which is available uh, during an exercise. And on the maps, uh, advances of troops were, of course, um, projected. We have um, army, we have air force maps, and we have uh, sea maps. And there is more large-scale strategic map in which we have projected an exercise in case that the, the orange block would attack a NATO country and then the exercise uh, develops. And in the end, of course, NATO always has to win in the exercise. And every morning briefings were held here for the, uh, um, uh, for the staff working on the bunker, uh, of course, presided by the uh, chief of the joint staff. Yeah. If you look at the map of Belgium, we are now at the far western corner of Belgium, at uh, Kemmel, and the bunker is built in the Kemmelberg, which is here. This would be the joint staff bunker. So we're very close to the coastline, very close to France. Uh, and shape, the NATO command, is uh, in Mons. Supreme headquarters, allied, allied powers, powers in Europe. Europe. If a war would break out, the Belgian Army Command would retreat to this place um, to direct all offensives or counteroffensives on the front lines. Um, the bunker itself is protected against uh, conventional bombardments with a large concrete plate, but it's not uh, NBC protected, so if a nuclear bomb would fall here, it would be, it would be disastrous, of course. Uh, furthermore, there is, there is no place to sleep in the bunker itself. Um, they did shifts from about eight hours and then they were replaced by other uh, staff officers um, and sleeping would be in the uh, barracks in Yper or in hotels nearby. Uh, same for food, um, they had to bring their own <laughs> snacks as it were. Um, there was no kitchen here, there's no mess here, so uh, food would be brought from the barracks in Yper or people would go to eat in, in the barracks in Yper. If they wanted to come to here, <clears throat> so the bunker is located there. But this is the operational sector. All this is the operational sector. So here's the River Rhine. So here we had engineer battalions who have, were tasked to, in, if the bridges were blown up, to, to cross the bridges. And then <coughs> we had two brigades in Germany, in this, the Belgian sector, first B Corps. And we had <coughs> two, two brigades permanently, permanently stationed in Germany. And then we had Komureki. Komureki was light cavalry uh, on CVRTs, for example. And when the, the, the enemy would come from the east, they would perform what we call a slowing maneuver. So they would recce the enemy to see what was it, what, where, they, where do they come from, and where are they heading for, and then try to slow them down. A little bit like the Ukrainians do today with the Russian invasion, they slow it down as much as they can. So, Komoreki would take the first shock. Then the two brigades would come and <coughs> hopefully have enough time to deploy. And then all the rest of the Belgian army would move through Cologne and move up to the front line, as far as is possible, of course. Uh, the, the Russians were not uh, destroying bridges and all that stuff. So one of the main enemies was the Spetsnaz, the Russian special forces. Because, well, if we know that this is strategically important, they will surely know. They are not totally stupid. So if they could block this main area here, that would be a big problem. Very big problem. Because that meant that the rest of the Belgian army, with the reserve troops, also the American troops landing in Antwerp and in Zeebrugge and in Amsterdam, they had to move to the operational sector. So it was... The essence was to gain time for all these movements to come up. And that was uh, a, a very tricky affair. But as it shows later, after the Cold War was over, <coughs> the East Germans and the Russians were afraid that we would invade them. They were never planning actually to invade us on such a scale. They actually never did. And they never envisioned that. They were far more afraid from us than we were actually from them. So it was mad, a mutual sure destruction. Everybody was afraid of everybody. So that made it a good thing. See? The problem would also be with um, 
all these East German and uh, former Western troops, actually the Russians did not trust them very much because they would come into countries where the culture was their former culture and they would see all these rich warehouses and shops and all that stuff and it was calculated that most probably the Russian army would disintegrate because all these the, the troops would be overwhelmed by everything they saw. One little note at the end of the war when the Russians went to Berlin, they noted that in the farmhouses and in the houses, the tables were with white clothes, the blankets, everything was super clean. They never saw that in Russia. So the troops were surprised that the enemy was so rich even at the end of the war. So it was calculated, <coughs> somebody came up with a psychological warfare assessment that it could well be that if the Warsaw Pact would move, they would slowly disintegrate because the troops would have been confronted with all these wealthy places and they would try to steal. And that is what we see now in Ukraine, actually. They, they, that's what they do, because they don't have this wealth. And so that's why the Russian army for the moment though, has troubles in really coordinating and moving with other problems too. But the troops are confronted with a country that is extremely rich and they are extremely poor. But the bunker is actually a poor man's solution, yes. Yes. Just going to uh, a sneak peek into the bells and display cases, but they are working on electricity, so it's a bit messy at the moment. Um, here we talk about the Belgian army during the Cold War. We have the first Belgian Corps, which is basically uh, based in Germany. We have the, um, the interior forces such as the paratroopers, communications, uh, we have the Air Force, the, uh, the Royal Navy, the Health Service, Medical Service, and of course we also talk about uh, the Belgians in Korea, uh, which is the first large-scale conflict of the Cold War. And we have also something that's called the 10th province. Belgium has, uh, had nine provinces at that time during the Cold War, but a lot of people were living in the, Ger in the Belgian sector in Germany, a lot of uh, soldiers with their families, and this part of Germany was called the Tenth Province as an, ex, uh, an extra addition to, to Belgium. There were even schools, uh, hospitals only for Belgian, uh, Belgian children and Belgian families. And the rest is a, um, an overview of different uh, uniforms, different uh, branches of the Belgian Armed Forces during this period. This is a very particular object. It, uh, it's the American M1 helmet, but it has been pierced by a Chinese uh, shrapnel uh, during the Korean War, 1953, March 1953, at Shatko. Um, the soldier who was wearing this helmet did survive the war, um, but the helmet was donated to the military museum already in 1953 as an object of war. We had a little stand and one of the stands was this photograph. And some of the veterans came up to Jan and me, and somebody else was with us. What's his name? Cornelius Fred. And so Korean he, war veteran. And he said, uh, This man is sitting there at the table. <laughs> so Jan and his colleague straight went on and tried to interview him. Yeah. And then I think you donated the photo, I think, to him, is it not? Yeah, yeah, we interviewed him yeah, yeah, for the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. His name was Leon Tutelius. Tutelius, yeah. yeah. Well, that was his we, name. we were really surprised that we didn't know who he was. One, one, one of the guys, one of the uh, Corvette said, I know him, he's here. He's here he wanted to get him, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, and he was like, oh yeah, this is my photograph, I remember it. <laughs> the rest didn't say very much. Um, this is a typical Belgian uniform of the early 1950s. The end of the 40s, they're still wearing the British uniform of the Second World War. Um, this is a Belgian uh, tank officer of the Second uh, Guides, uh, in this typical tank suit. Um, this is a Blend Decider, which is called, it's an anti-tank weapon, uh, with um, the mortar next to it. A missile. A missile, yeah, a missile. We have a uniform of the Belgian troops in Korea um, with a typical brown uh, hat. 
This is an artillery soldier with his uh, goniometer for calculating distances. We have a uh, female soldier of the medical service and of course the paratrooper completely dressed for his jump uh, out of the, the airplane. And he has also a special weapon, this is the Thal M3, uh, used by paratroopers, which the, the, uh, the, the, stock. the stock is a, yeah, you can fold it, it's a foldable stock. Uh, this display case uh, continues the story of the Belgian army. We have a soldier of logistics from the 1980s. This soldier of the engineers is wearing an NBC suit for disinfecting uh, infected material. We have uh, different uh, weapons used by the Belgian army. We have our sailor and of course our pilot of the uh, F-104 Starfighter, uh, which was used by the Belgian army. Are all of these pieces original or are some of them reproduction? All pieces we exhibit in the Royal Military Museum in a different site are all original, except indicated, but only very, very, very few. Um, on each floor of the bunker, of course, there are toilets. Nowadays, we can't use these, these anymore, uh, but we, we kept them as a, um, for the people to, to see, not to visit, of course. Uh, one more thing. Uh, one more thing important about the bunker: it's very well protected against uh, fire. Uh, we have these those uh, fire extinguishers. We also have equipment uh, in case of fire. People had to, uh, to make a lot of noise. Um, and in case of a fire, we have these uh, all this equipment to extinguish extinguish flames from a distance to protect paper, to protect people. Um, and of course, also these large hooks um, to evacuate people from fire or important documents. Uh, you can uh, get them out of the fire with it. I think now we're going to get, that, going to get upstairs again, uh, back to, uh, to the sunshine. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you would like to see more of this site and more of what Belgium has to offer with regards to war history, check out the War Heritage Institute online. There's a bajillion different sites, really well preserved and incredible to view and to access, and I encourage you to do so. The information for that is down below in the description. Check out those links, and I'll see you next time.